All right. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new project. We'll create an empty activity. Call this guy CSC 250 lab. Um, what was that? Four, nine. Okay, finish. All right, so the idea was we have this thing called the Pythagorean theorem. Did I make you choose which of the... Uh... Uh, solves your application should present two edit text boxes for A and B and calculate the C button, which should do the math to present the result. Okay. Um, then I told you uh, that there's this math library and you should have been able to click on it and um, figure out how to call the functions based on what we have uh, learned in class in terms of how to call functions. All right, so let's go ahead and build our user interface here. Just to minimize that so I get a bigger user interface. I'll delete this text view. I'll right click and convert view. We'll convert this to a linear layout. And I'm going to set its orientation to vertical. All right, and then we'll go ahead and create our uh, output text view. This guy will be up here at the top. And maybe we'll uh, say something like current value of C, we'll put in that uh, text box. I'll increase the text size. Uh, it's like 30, something like that. And then we'll also set the gravity to center all right so that's going to be our current value of c i'll go ahead then and also give us a button for calculating the value of c There's calculate C. I am going to need programmatic access to this text view. So this is going to be um, CTV. All right, then we're going to need a couple of edit texts for our uh, A and B. So under text, and these guys are both going to be um, decimal values. Uh, you could have gone with just a number as well, but I'm just going to choose decimal value. And I don't know if I had shown you this before, but in hint, we can say something like that, enter a value for A. And that's just a placeholder that kind of tells you what you should be putting into that uh, that box. I'll go ahead and give myself a second box and say enter the value for B. Or we can say side A and side B. Maybe that's the... Something like that. 
we are going to need to have programmatic access to both of those guys. So we're going to call this guy a et for edit text. And this guy will be called b et for edit text. All right, so now I have programmatic access to both of these edit text to read stuff in. I have programmatic access to this uh, text view to write something out. Now I need to go ahead and, well, give myself access to those guys and then write a handler for this button. Let's go into our code over here. We'll give ourselves some private fields at the top. So we're gonna have a private text view, CTV. We'll have a private edit text, AET. BET, so we could actually define two different edit texts on a single line if we want to, or you could just have two separate lines like this. That goes for any variable in Java. We could say something like int a comma b comma c. Um, I think we could say something like that as well. So you can define variables of the same type all on a single line. I'm not necessarily suggesting that's good or bad programming practice. I would say if you need to define too many of them, you might wanna have them on separate lines, but I think this seems like a reasonable enough thing. So we're the, at this point, these are empty variables. We don't actually have anything in them inside of onCreate, where we're gonna actually put stuff in those guys. All right, so we'll come in here. We'll go ahead and say C, I'll say this.ctv is equal to this dot find view by ID R dot ID dot CTV. This dot A E T is equal to this dot find view by ID R dot ID dot A E T. This dot B E T is equal to this dot find view by ID R dot ID dot B. Et. All right, so now I have programmatic access to those three things, two of them for reading stuff in, one of them for writing my answer out. Now I want to go ahead and write my um, handler for my on click. So we'll say public void on calculate C button pressed. We want to go ahead and read in our two integers from our two edit texts. So we'll say int a is equal to integer dot parse int this dot a e t dot get text to string. Do the same thing for b. Now we should have a and b as integers and it's a squared plus b squared. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So what we need to do is we now need to do the uh, math for these guys. So we can go ahead and say a is equal to, now nothing keeps us from saying something like this, a times a. That's technically a squared, right? But if we were gonna use a function from the uh, math, the math class in Java has a pow function. So here's the pow function that takes two parameters and it actually takes in doubles to take one value to another uh, power. All right, now this guy is static. Static makes it a class method. 
How do we call class methods? Using the name of the class in which the method was defined. What's the name of the class that we're looking at here? It's called math. So we call this function by saying math.pow, passing it two parameters. Say math.pow a squared. Now it is expecting these guys, it's gonna say it's expect some doubles here. Um, required, uh, provided a, uh, well actually, hold on. Math.pow, if I go back here, it actually returns a double. And I'm trying to put the answer back into a int. So I can typecast it to an int here. What do you think typecasting a int will do, typecasting a double to an int? If I have 3.14, turned into an int, what result will that give me? If I have 3.99 turned into an int, what result will that give me? So if I take this double value, 3.14, and I typecast it to an int, what value will that give me as output? Anybody can uh, shout out. Um, would it wound up to four? Uh, well, 3.14, would that, even in real life, would that round up or that round down? Um, I'm, uh, I was talking about 3.99, it would probably wound up, and the 3.14 might wound down? I Okay. So a, a guess, a reasonable guess would be this becomes a three, this becomes a four, right? That's what a human being might do. If I need to get the integer version of this, 3.14, I might say, well, as a human being, I'd probably round that down because it's less than 3.5. So I'll make that a three. Similarly, 3.99, we might say, well, as a human being, that's pretty close to four, I'd round that up to four. When you typecast something to an integer, it does what's called truncates. It just cuts the decimal point off. So both of these are three. All right. So just an important thing to know about when you turn something that's a floating point type into an int, it doesn't try to do anything fancy with the value. It doesn't say, well, if you're 3.99, I'll round you up to four. It just says, if you're three point anything, you're now a three. I'm just going to chop the decimal place off. And that's called truncating. Okay, so this will set A to itself squared. Then we'll say B is itself squared. All right, so if A squared plus B squared equals C squared, then we take the sum of the two squares, and then we have to take the square root of those. It's just algebra, right? So we'll say int sum is equal to a plus b. Then we'll say, technically this could be a double. So we'll say double c is equal to, we wanna get the square root of a and uh, the sum, a and b added together. So we'll go back here and we say, it's actually funny that it uh, has some extra functions here, but there's a square root one down here. Actually, hold on, I wanna look at that real quick. Did that actually do Pythagorean theorem? It does. <laughs> so uh, I'll show you this here in a few minutes. So there's actually a function here called hypotenuse that you pass at A and B and it'll give you the uh, the uh, uh, length of C. So this actually does the whole thing for you. It's not what I expected you to find in there, but it actually does have a function called hypotenuse that you just give it the two sides and it automatically does the algebra for you of getting the A squared plus B squared and getting the square root of that. But we're gonna use square root here. 
since we're going to say we know how to do algebra. So here's square root, I give it a double, and it returns for me the correctly rounded positive square root of a double value. All right, so I'll take the square root of my sum and that's gonna give me a double and I'll go ahead and put that in my text view. So this is math dot, oh, we gotta go back here and look at it. This guy is static. That means it's owned by the class. So we call it using the name of the class on which it was defined. This guy is called, this guy is defined inside of the math class. So we'll say math dot square root. We'll pass it a value. It wants a double. We're actually going to pass it uh, integer in our case, which it'll just typecast to a double by just putting a dot zero on the end of it. But it's going to give me a double because the square root of a, a integer is not guaranteed to be a whole number. So we will get the answer as a double. So this will be math dot square root of sum. And then we'll say this dot CTV set text is going to be now I want to convert a double here. How do I make a, a double like the double stored in C? How do I turn that into a string? Again, giving us evidence that Java is a string based language. How do I turn a double into a string? Can't you use a two string? Uh, so you want me to do this? Yeah, I think. Okay. What kind of animal is C here? Cat, dog, object, or primitive type? So this is one of our built-in types, isn't it? We have bite, short, int, long, char, float, double, and boolean. So double is a primitive type, and primitive types can only hold a value. They don't have functions. Hence the reason this shows up in red. So I can't call two string on C. That's not going to let me pull it off. So how do I turn C a double? And I could be asking the same question of how do I turn an integer A into a string or you know a char C into a string? How do I turn this double into a string? It's our little trick that we've used over and over and over again. Start with the empty string, concatenate onto that our double. And this will create the string out of this. This was a differentiating thing between Python and uh, Java for us. In Python, the concatenation operator required both sides to be strings. So in Python, if we wanted to convert a um, double into a string, we had to use the str function. So if we were doing this in Python, we would have said str of c like that and that would take this value and convert it into a string because in python the empty string concatenated with c would give us an error because it would say that this operator is not defined for a string and a double it's only defined for strings and strings but in java um, as I've advertised, since it's a string based language, if you, you can very conveniently move things between strings and other types. So the concatenation operator only requires one of the sides to be a string. So since I have at least one string here, this guy will be treated as concatenation, not as addition. So this will produce for us the string representation of C. Okay, and if we operate off of 
the example we are likely to get in here. And there to bring it up. Yeah, here it is. We can just do a one, two, three. So we'll go back in here. We'll go ahead and I need to, I've set up my function for my on click, but I haven't actually hooked that up. So I need to go over here. I need to click on my button. I need to go down to his on click. Get the button selected. Here's on click, on calculate button pressed. So we'll go ahead and run this. And now when we click this, it'll read from this edit text and convert it to an int. It'll read from this edit text and convert it to an int. It'll mult, it'll get the square of both of these guys, add them together, and then set this text box equal to the square root of these, the sum of these two guys squared. Have my simulator running. There it is. All right, so we can do something like a two and a six. Then hit calculate. That gives us the other side, the hypotenuse being 6.32. So this is 36.4, which is uh, 40, the square root. Uh, 40 is 6.32. All right, so this guy seems to be doing its uh, job. All right, so I think that covers our uh, lab from uh, last class. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so let me go ahead and import this into version control. All right, so it is now up there. that link on to uh, Slack. Now I'll go ahead and reopen our merge sort here that we started talking about uh, uh, last time I just given you a recursive uh, intro with merge sort, but I don't think we've actually started merge sort yet. Oh, we still actually have to write that uh, factorial. So let me finish writing that here real quick. <clears throat> I've given you the code for writing it recursively, but you needed to incorporate it in there. All right, so the idea here, our answer is gonna go in this answer text view. I'm gonna make this guy a little bit bigger. There we go. And then our input edit text is up here. enter a number like that. And I'll make the font bigger on that guy too, again, so I can read it on my screen. All right, so we're gonna read something in from this edit text and write it out, well, calculate the factorial and write it out into this text view. This text view is called answer TV. This guy is called input ET. So we'll go into our main activity we already gave ourselves access to these guys as our starting point. 
We already have our on factorial button clicked where I showed you how to read in from an edit text and then set the value for that guy. Now we want to go ahead and write our factorial function. I'm going to make this guy private because we're only going to need this inside of this class. So when this button is clicked, we want to read in the current value, convert it to an integer, and then calculate the factorial of that, writing the answer inside of answer TV. All right. So we talked about last time how factorial is actually a recursively defined function. For instance, the factorial of four is four times three times two times one, which is 24. But I can also think of the factorial of four as being four times the factorial of three, which is three times the factorial of two, which is two times the factorial of one, which is just one. All right, so factorial is a recursively defined function where recursively defined means a function that calls itself from within itself. All right, we put this particular call to factorial on hold while we wait for the answer to this. Similarly, we put this call to factorial on hold while we wait for the answer to this. We put this version of factorial on hold while we wait for the answer to this. And this version just gets an answer, which then gives us our answer here to allow us to finish this math which then gives us the answer here, which allows us to finish this math, which then gets us the answer here, which allows us to finish this math. And now we have our answer. So we'll go ahead and write factorial both ways. We'll write it iteratively and we'll also write it recursively just so we can see the two. Factorial is a good first example for recursion because it's so simple. Um, but realistically, just from a performance perspective, we would probably write factorial iteratively like this because fact uh, recursive functions, while they can sometimes be very elegant and that they're short, they use a lot of memory. So, um, you know, don't view uh, recursion as an upgrade or a downgrade from iter uh, an iterative solution. Um, but sometimes uh, recursive solutions can be very powerful and sometimes it's the best way to describe something, but just kind of keep in the back of your head that recursion How do I talk about recursion? I'll just put a little note here for the next slide. <clears throat> recursion can lead to relatively short solutions two problems at the cost of higher memory usage. And the reason it's higher memory usage is because we had to put this entire call to this version of factorial on hold. We had to pause it and create a brand new call to factorial, which takes up more memory. And we had to pause that one and create a brand new so on and so forth. So in order to calculate four factorial, we actually called the factorial function four total times, taking up four times the amount of memory, um, presumably, which we can say, well, that's not that great, but we kind of had the iteration built into that. And we'll see it here in a second when we write both versions of this. So we're gonna call this guy factorial rec. And we'll call this guy factorial inner. All right. Well, factorial inner is pretty simple. We're just going to have a int running total. We'll start that off at one because anything times one will be itself. Um, we could even start that off at n if we wanted to. And then we could say for int i is equal to n minus one, i is greater than zero, i minus minus running total times equals i. 
So if we had a four here, running total starts off at four. We'll start I off at four minus one, which is three. So this will be four times three times two times one, and then we exit out. And then we will return running total here. So this is the iterative version of factorial where we just do something n number of times. <clears throat> if we wanted to start our running total off at one, we would then just start at n here. First time through, we'd have um, one times n. And this is not plus equals, it's times equals. <clears throat> So you can decide which of those two approaches you like better. They both ultimately do the same thing. I suppose by starting it off at N, we go through this loop one fewer times. And you really could even say, we can keep going as long as we are greater than one and go through even another fewer times because anything times one is itself. So as we count down from four to three to two to one, the last time we actually need to do math here is when we multiply by two. But nothing's hurting us from just saying we're gonna go as long as it's greater than or equal to one or greater than zero. Ultimately, we'll get the same result out of this guy. Okay. Then the recursive version of this guy mimics what we wrote in here, that four factorial is actually equal to four times three factorial, which is actually equal to three times two factorial, which is actually equal to two times one factorial. And that guy is equal to one. So if N is equivalent to one, return one. Otherwise, return n times factorial recursive of n minus 1. So this is a recursive version of this problem. If n is 1, return 1. And a lot of times in books, you would just see, remember that uh, curly braces are not actually required. For an if statement, it's if followed by a statement, a single statement, which you should do if it's true. In this case, since I only have one line, I don't actually need the curly braces. Um, now, I teach this from the perspective that always use the curly braces, it's never wrong. The only reason I'm purposely taking them away here is just to show you how compact the factorial recursive solution can end up being. It can be two lines of code here. All right, so let's see these work and then I'll show you an even scarier version of this. <laughs> All right, um, well, an even shorter version of this using something called an inline if statement, which you may never use in your entire life, but I'll at least show you that it exists in case you ever see it. All right, so when our button is clicked here, let's go ahead and we'll try to call our factorial iterative first. So we have our current value. We'll go ahead and get our curve value as int. And this will be an integer dot parse int of curve value. So we'll convert that guy to that. And then we'll go ahead and set our text equal to the empty string concatenated with this dot factorial iter of current value as int. Okay. So that'll call our iterative version of this and set the text for it. Let's go. Uh, I think we already had this button hooked up from the information I had originally given you. So we'll go ahead and run this and we'll try four factorial. Enter our 
number. We'll put in a four. And there's our 24. If we change this guy to a six. We get a 720. Now let's change this to our recursive version. So it's solving the same problem, but a little bit, uh, um, well, solving it, but it's solving this, solving it recursively. Run this again. There's our four. There's our six. So they both give us the same answers. Now I'll go ahead and show you, um, here we'll create a, another one of these, call this guy factorial rec two. We have something called an inline if statement. And an inline if statement has a Boolean expression comment here. So it's a Boolean, Boolean expression followed by a question mark, followed by a true expression, followed by a colon, followed by the false expression. Like that. So this is called an inline if statement. So rather than following this syntax, we ask a question, if something is true, do this, else do something else. This allows us to say this line boils down to the answer of this map. So what we would actually do here is we would return n equal to one, one, or n times factorial rec two of n minus one. So outside of the comments, this entire function call is one line. So this is going to return some value. It's either going to return the true value or it's going to return the false value, depending on the outcome of this Boolean expression. So if n is currently one, it's just going to return a one. Otherwise, it'll return n times the factorial rec two of n minus one. So same logic we had before, it just gets at it using this thing called an inline if statement. Rec two there. And I'm pretty sure in line if statements support recursion. Yep. So same outputs. You never, ever, ever, ever have to use this. In fact, a lot of modern programmers maybe would have never seen that. But it's something that's uh, they the C programming language had in it. And if you're ever looking at example code from somebody else, you may run into a situation where you see um, that factorial thing pop up. All right, so three different ways of accomplishing our factorial thing. I'll go ahead and commit that just so you have the solution. Solution for factorial recursive example. Well, oh, I didn't do push. All right, so now it's up on GitHub. All right, so now let's look at merge sort to set us up for next class. Just give us an example. All right, we're going to do merge sort example. Now, when we're writing merge sort here, we want to think about this guy uh, recursively. I'm going to use this as my starting point. All right. 
So merge sort banks on a couple of pieces of information. Merge sort assumptions. A collection is trivially sorted if it only has one element in it. Now, that seems like an obvious statement, right? If I hand you a single number and I say sort this, it's already sorted, right? But you didn't even have to ask any questions. It's what's called trivially sorted, all right? Merge sort relies on the idea of uh, keep doing its, its thing un, um, as, until something is trivial, trivially sorted and then do the next thing. All right. And what I mean by this is as a human being, we can glance at this collection and say that is not sorted. Correct. Um, and actually, let me um, let me just randomize this a little bit more. I stole it from the previous the next screen. Give myself another three and uh, eight. All right, it would have worked the way it was before. Just I want to make sure we have a, a nice uh, non-pattern looking collection. So a human being can just glance at this collection and say, those are not in order because we are an intelligent God created being, right? Okay, so the idea here is we can say this is not in order, but if we're trying to tell a computer what to do, a computer for it to determine that this is not in order, it would have to go through and make sure that it's true that for every element, the next element is at least as large, something like that. It would have to go through a process of checking the, the contents of this to see if it was in order. The same process that you probably went through when you glanced at this and decided, yeah, that's not in order. Okay, you would have gone through that same process the difference here is, is that, that going through that same process uh, in a computer is a little bit more convoluted. So what a computer could say, though, is that it is true that it is guaranteed that this collection is not trivially sorted because there is more than one element in it. All right. So that's a guaranteed situation. Now, merge sort is implemented as a recursive function. So what we're going to say here is since this collection is not trivially sorted, what we're going to do is we are going to split it into two halves. I'm going to call merge sort in this left half. And once that is completely done, I'll call merge sort on this right half. Okay, so it's actually going to be a little bit until we finally get to call merge sort in this right half because we're going to be working on this left half from the first call to merge sort. We actually have two calls to merge sort here. All right, merge sort on the left half, merge sort of the right half. Now we ask ourselves the question, is this trivially sorted? The answer is no. So what do we do? We call merge sort on the left half. We call merge sort on the right half. Again, we're going to have to wait a little bit to get to this right half because we have to deal with the left half. Then we ask our ourselves, is this trivially sorted? It's still not a one list. So what do we do? We call merge sort on the left half. And we call merge sort on the right half. We ask ourselves, is this trivially sorted? It is. So we're done. Then we get to the right half. Is this trivially sorted? It is. So we're done. Now what we do is we go through a step called the merge step. And what the merge step does is it puts these guys in order. We start at the beginning of each of our lists. So the left half starts at bucket zero and goes all the way up to and including bucket zero. The right half starts at bucket one and goes all the way up to and including bucket one. So we say, which of these guys should come first? The two or the three? We would probably 
create a temporary array here that had nothing in it. And we would say, who's the winner? The two or the three? Well, the two is the smaller number. So we'll record that. Then we say, who's the winner? An illegal position or a three? Because we're off the end of our left half. So we'll say the three. Then we'll copy those answers back over in line into our array. And that call to merge sort is done. We get to the right half here. We go ahead and, you know, we call it, it's not a one list. So we call on the left, we call on the right. They're both one list. We merge them back together. We get a one and five. So now we have finished these two calls to merge sort. So now what we do is we create a temporary array. Let me just finish through this example and we'll write this next time. We ask ourselves, so we have two, two lists. We ask ourselves, who's the winner between two and one? Which is less, this guy or this guy? The one is less. Which is less, the two or the five? The two. Which is less, the three or the five? The three. Which is left? the uh which is less either legal position or the five so the five wins by default we copy those values back over here and remember we're actually making these changes in memory so those copies happen up here and now we've finished our left half call to our original merge sorts and we do the same thing on the right half. Ultimately getting back up to this level and doing that same merge step one last time. All right, so in class on Wednesday, we'll actually write um, a merge sort. We'll either write the merge portion of it, which we probably will do, and then I'll make you, I'm sorry, we'll write the divide portion of it, and then I'll make you write the merge portion for your homework assignment for Friday. All right, questions, comments, concerns, bribes. All right, I'll see everybody on Wednesday.